Good morning. Something went wrong in uh, the live recording uh, during the first lecture, so I am uh, re-recording this from my office. So this may be a slightly abbreviated uh, version of it because we don't have the live interchange of questions and answers and things like that. Hopefully from the next lecture we would have figured out how to uh, capture and retain the recording uh, live. So this course is uh, CHE 2176. The title is Mathematical Modeling and uh, Solutions, Computer Solutions of uh, Engineering uh, Systems. Uh, here is the course outline. I go by the nickname Kumar. So you can call me Kumar uh, if you need to catch my attention. And you can reach me by email or you can drop in my office anytime if you have any questions regarding this course and um, my office is in uh, 210 and the uh, lectures meet twice a week Tuesday and Thursday from 9 10 to 10 30 which you already know uh, from time to time I might schedule some tutorials when I am particularly illustrating software like Comsol or Hisys or uh, the MATLAB <laughs> regarding the course outline and uh, the procedures. Um, I do have um, regular office hours uh, on Tuesdays set up exclusively for this course and this will be on Tuesdays from uh, 1 to 4 in my office room 210. In addition I do have an open door policy which means that uh, uh, you can drop in my office anytime and if I'm free I will certainly attend to uh, whatever questions that you have about this course. Now there are prerequisites for this course. These are Math 2090 and CHE 2160 and 2171. Uh, one of them I think is a course on differential equations and linear algebra and another one is on mass and energy balance. The third one is on introduction to computers. So we're not going to be going into details of uh, computer architecture or uh, representing numbers and computers and things like that. We will focus on developing mathematical models to describe chemical processes and then developing numerical methods to solve those mathematical models using computers where we will be programming our own solutions in the MATLAB environment and in addition learn to use uh, CAND packages like ISIS and the COMSOL. There is no uh, required textbook for this course, so I guess I'm saving you a little bit of money there. And I will distribute a set of notes that I'm working on developing. Um, so that will be on Modal. I will use Modal as the primary mechanism for distributing uh, the entire uh, course content, um, assignments, solutions, uh, solutions to quizzes and things like that. I do have a set of recommended books at the end of this section and I will uh, point out pretty soon. But before that, the assessment rule. Um, I use what is called a norm reference instead of criterion reference grading system. So what happens in this system is that uh, there is no absolute marks. That is, if you get 90%, you get an A, or you get 80%, you get a B. And um, what uh, instead what we would do is uh, some of the exams may be tough and uh, average may class average may be 70 or 60 or something like that and so there will be a distribution curve that is appropriate for this level of the course and uh, I will use that to assign maybe 15 to 20 percent as A in the bottom portion as D or F and distributed between B and C in between. You really need to make an effort to fail this course uh, meaning don't attend the class, don't submit assignments, don't do any effort you're guaranteed uh, to get a D or an F. But if you make some effort, you should have no difficulty in passing this course because I'll, I will challenge you at a high level, but I will give you all the help that you need. So you need to take the initiative and uh, learn. Uh, and in the same way, you need to earn your A as well uh, because I will challenge you at a very high level. And if you are able to rise up to that challenge and be in the top 15% or so, uh, you, know, you would earn your A. Um, I will have about 8 to 10 homework problems. I expect individual effort in homeworks, particularly each homework will involve some sort of a computer solution. And uh, it is okay if you consult with each other, with your friends, neighbors, uh, before going to solve the problem so that you understand what the problem is. Once you have understood it, 
when you're in front of a computer solving it, I want individual effort. I don't want a group of four people sitting in front of a computer or one person writing a program and then copying and printing and say we work together. That is not acceptable. You must write your program yourself and that means to know two programs can be identical. If they are identical, all those uh, persons involved in that will get a grade of zero. Now the assignments would be worth 20%, so it's a significant percentage. And then there'll be two midterm exams. I have tentatively scheduled them for February 24th and March 31st, and uh, they would be worth 20% each. And then there'll be final exams scheduled by the university on May 11th, 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. And that will be worth 40%. Um, the assignments are due at 4 p.m. on the due date, and uh, you can drop them in my office. I would expect you to print out and I will give appropriate instructions for what to include in your submission as a solution for an assignment problem. Uh, as I said, I use Moodle to distribute and communicate with you and email. And there are forums on Moodle that I've created. So you're welcome to give your feedback or you can drop by and tell me that oh, this, part is, this part of the course is not going well and I will try to uh, help you with additional lectures if necessary. Uh, the learning outcomes. Uh, the, as I said, this course is about mathematical model building and about computational solution of those mathematical models. So we will need to learn how to build models and how to classify these models into various groups like uh, lump versus distributed model, steady state versus dynamic model, or linear versus nonlinear. So in the next several lectures, we will be building examples of models so that we understand the process of model building. But this course will only open up the door for you and uh, the other courses in chemical engineering will dwell deeper into the mathematical model building process in fluid mechanics and heat transfer, mass transfer, reactors, etc. So we're just going to see the common principles that we apply in building models. And uh, then we will learn about how to solve linear and nonlinear systems of algebraic equations, how to represent data that you collect from a lab in the form of a functional approximation by least squares method, then how to carry out uh, differentiation and integration uh, of numerically gathered data. For example, in a reactor course, you might be measuring in a lab concentration as a function of time, and you need to do uh, the derivative of the concentration with respect to time, how fast the concentration is changing, which is related to the rate of reaction. So you, all you have is a numerical set of data, and you need to learn how to uh, take the derivative of such a data. Then we will learn how to solve ordinary differential equations and of the initial value type and the boundary value type. We will see what they are as we develop these examples over the next few year, uh, lectures. And then we'll have a um, partial differential equation, which will be the most complicated set of equations that we will develop. And we may not go into the theory of numerical way of solving these partial differential equations, but we will introduce packages like ComSol that help us in solving partial differential equation. So at the end of the course, you should be exposed to a wide variety of software tools, wide variety of problems that you can develop and uh, solve. And of course, you should be able to integrate the skills that you have acquired in this course and use them in subsequent courses, whether it is fluid mechanics, heat transfer, thermodynamics. <coughs> 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 Excuse me, reactor engineering, etc. Now, there are certain rules that I uh, expect uh, rules of behavior in the class. First, do not use the cell phones, do not engage in disruptive behavior, and um, you can read the rest. Uh, well, the things that I want to uh, highlight would be plagiarism will not be tolerated. That means you cannot submit someone else's work as your own, it must be an individual effort. And those caught plagiarizing will automatically receive a uh, mark of zero for that particular work and additional uh, actions may be taken, uh, meaning uh, report this incidents to the department and faculty level. So the university policies on st scholastic integrity and honesty should be strictly enforced and uh, you should help us in uh, achieving that. So if you notice somebody uh, trying to copy from you, discourage that and bring it to my attention. Uh, I do expect individual effort, as I said, while you are uh, working on the problem. And in every assigned work, whether it's exam assignments, quizzes, I expect this pledge from you on your 
uh, sheet that uh, I pledge that I have neither given nor received any unauthorized assistance in this assignment, exercise, or examination, and then sign it. Now the course syllabus, uh, you can go through it. It basically outlines the topics that we will be covering in this course. And uh, uh, <clears throat> these are the list of recommended reference books. Uh, if I'm taking a material from any one of the single book, I'll tell you the particular sections and the uh, chapter number. And this is my contact number. Okay, let's uh, briefly pause that one. So let's uh, now look at uh, the modeling process. So I'm going to share with you uh, a general uh, framework that I use to show the relationship between what we are modeling, which I call the physical world, and uh, how we represent it in terms of the mathematical language, and what is the relationship between these two links. We will explore that first. And then there is another link, which is from the mathematical model to the numerical representation, because the mathematical models are often so complicated that we cannot solve them analytically. So we need the help of a computer. So what are the processes involved in examining that link? So the link between the physical world and its description by a mathematical language involves a lot of simplifying assumptions because the physical world is so complicated that we often have to make simplifying assumptions to represent it in terms of a mathematical model. Once we achieve that, then it's still so complicated that we need to use computers to solve. So we need to introduce further approximations and what are the sources of errors for these approximations that we will examine. Okay, now the physical world, as I said, can be different things for different people. For a physicist, it could be simply the planetary system, the galaxies, how do they evolve, how do they uh, move around, and can we represent them by um, a mathematical equation. Okay, so we can, uh, such a physicist can engage either in empirical observation by simply making a note of where every planet is at every instant of time over years or centuries, and then they can get an idea of a repetitive pattern, for example, in this. And using that data, they can predict, okay, on such and such a date, uh, the solar eclipse, for example, is likely to happen because we have this pattern repeating in the past in a certain way. So those would be called basically empirical models, models based on data, observed data. Whereas an example of a conceptual model would be, for example, Newton's law of motion. Okay, so again, physical world, the observation is that driving force for developing such models. But in the case of uh, the Newton, the famous story is that he observed an apple falling and looked at the moon and it is not falling and then proposed that both of them are governed by the same gravitational laws and sought an explanation of uh, the planetary motion and uh, the previous laws that were deduced from empirical observations, for example, Kepler's laws. He was able to generalize them by uh, proposing uh, the theory of uh, gravitational attraction. So in that conceptual modeling, you need to do thought experiments uh, and propose concepts which are probably a bit more difficult to explain in a more fundamental way. For example, if someone asks, what is a force or what is gravity? You would be hard pressed to give an explanation, but if you accept that uh, as a concept and then the consequences of that in a logical manner, you can use to explain or predict. The purpose of any model, in fact, is to be able to predict uh, the outcomes from uh, such a model in such that physical world. Now, uh, for us chemical engineers, that physical world consists of process plants involving transport, reaction, equilibrium processes. None of the courses you would have seen yet, but you will see as you go along in your uh, education. So you will take a course on fluid mechanics, a course on heat transfer, separation processes, reaction processes, etc. So in each one of these courses, you will try to understand the physics a bit more, develop mathematical models, develop perhaps graphical solution procedures or numerical solution procedures. So in that respect, this course should be helpful in getting the solution part of it. The physics you will examine in greater detail in each one of these courses. So in this course, what we are going to do is survey the whole generic procedure that we are going to use for building 
mathematical models in a variety of courses. So I will take examples from many different courses. So in that sense, this course is perhaps slightly different from a purely math course that, that you might have seen or a purely computer course that you might have taken earlier, where you really wonder, where am I going to use uh, solving these differential equations? But here, the problems are rooted in applications that you will face once you go into the uh, workforce. So you will be analyzing chemical uh, engineering process systems. So I just want to emphasize that the mathematical model is an approximation to the physical world. The approximations are in describing the physical world, we make some simplifying assumptions. So it is never an exact replica of uh, what happens in the physical world. And the knowledge may never be complete. For example, if we take Newton's law, at that time it was a great discovery, but it was not complete and it fitted most of the observations, but once you go into uh, events that are occurring at the speed of light where relativity becomes important, there was some inadequacy which Einstein, again through thought experiments, um, improved on. Okay, so that model building process is a continuing process of trying to understand the process more and then building gradually better and better models. The other thing that we need to learn is to be able to classify these models because the solution procedures that we are going to develop are very dependent on the nature of the problem that we're going to look at. Okay, So one of the classification that we will see would be to classify the model as either linear or nonlinear model. Now, a, a very simple, naive, trivial example of a linear model would be the flat earth model. Okay, so we see uh, the earth for short distances to be flat and we assume that the earth is flat forever. And uh, at one time, uh, human beings in fact did think that. And another uh, simplifying model would be to think that earth is the center of the solar system. Okay, and there was in fact a very strong uh, belief in that at one time. And uh, so models are successively improved as the observations become more and more uh, precise. And um, a linear model simply assumes that the relationship between the observed variable and the controlled variable, if I call y as the observed variable and x as the controlled variable, if that relationship, I take a data and then I can put a straight line through that and represent it as model y equals ax plus b, then I would call that as a linear model. Now, if I continue to observe the data, maybe I will notice this. Okay, so the curve is actually nonlinear. It is not linear. So nonlinear is defined in a negative way, anything that is not linear. So it will include everything that is not linear. So quadratic, cubic, polynomials, exponentials, sines, cosines, all these would be considered as nonlinear uh, models. Okay, so this nonlinearity can be in the form of an algebraic equation or a differential equation. So we need to understand what kind of systems result in algebraic equations, what kind of systems result in uh, ordinary differential equations. So given a model, you should be able to discern these things. Okay, this is a linear or a nonlinear model. This is an ordinary differential equation of the initial value type or a boundary value type because the method that you're going to use to solve that will depend on that understanding of the classification. Um, Nonlinear models are often very difficult to solve analytically and uh, before the computer era people were solving it basically using graphical method okay and you will see those in courses that you're going to do later on uh, in your uh, CHE curriculum <coughs> but nowadays they've largely been replaced uh, since the 70s and 80s computers have played an increasingly larger role in uh, trying to solve these problems now, steady state, what does steady state mean to you? And we had this discussion in the class. Simply, it means that there is no variation of any observed variable with respect to time. Okay, so things don't change with time, so they are steady. Whereas a dynamic model would be the opposite. So the variable would be changing. Okay, if you find x as a variable, a state variable, or y as a variable, and if it is varying with time, then we call such models as dynamic models. And uh, the other classification that you need to know is lumped versus distributed model. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, a lumped model simply assumes that there are no spatial variations. For example, I have a reactor, okay, and the reactor has certain feed coming in and certain feed going out, 
and some reaction that is taking place and I have a stirrer that keeps the contents in the reactor well mixed. Then if I take the concentration at a point here or a concentration at a point here, if I assume that this concentration is the same everywhere within that, then I would call that as a lumped model. Okay, so there is no spatial variation for lumped models. Okay, so this means no spatial variation in the dependent variable. Okay, a distributed model is the opposite of that. If there is a spatial variation, then I need to worry about how to track such spatial variations. That means there will be derivatives of that variable in, with respect to space and there could be three different directions in which that uh, variable can change. For example, if I take concentration here, the concentration, if it is a function of time, I have a dynamic model. If it is a function of position, x1, x2, x3, then I have a distributed model. Now, if it is a function of both space and time, then I have a distributed dynamic model. So when I have such a model, because the derivatives of that concentration with respect to x1, x2, x3, and t are all important, then I will end up describing it by a partial differential equation. Okay. Whereas if I have only uh, a lumped dynamic model, okay, a dynamic model, but that is lumped, then I will have an ordinary differential equation. Often it's called an initial value problem, IVP for initial value problem. Now, if I have a steady variable and that variable is changing in only one spatial dimension, okay, then also I end up with an ordinary differential equation, but that will be called a boundary value problem. Now, if I have a, a variable like concentration that is changing with one dimension, but also with time, then I will have again a partial differential equation. Okay, so the classification of partial differential equation again needs to be a bit more refined and we will do that uh, towards the end of this course. So at the end of this process we should be able to, you should be able to classify a given problem as either linear or nonlinear, steady or dynamic, lumped or distributed. And then you will have some clue on what type of methods can be used to solve such problems. Now the next link that we need to examine, which will also be part of this course, would be to examine the approximation of the mathematical model by a numerical model, a computer solution in a sense, because we are now dealing with continuous variables, uh, derivatives, but computers cannot do that, so we represent them by discrete numbers and relating the numbers. So that process is called the discretization process and there are errors introduced in that. And particularly for part differential equations, that's a major source of error. Now for uh, lumped steady state models, you often end up with algebraic equations. Those could be linear or nonlinear, but you end up with algebraic equations. And what we are going to do in the next uh, several lectures is build an example of each one of these types of uh, uh, model equations. Now here I'm basically summarizing all the things that I have talked about. So when I'm talking about a stream, the state of a stream, uh, let me give you a specific example of a problem that we are going to do uh, later on. This is a reactor condenser system that takes uh, hydrogen and carbon monoxide and produces methanol from that by reacting the two and in the reactor. And the reaction is not complete, meaning all the hydrogen and carbon monoxide is not consumed. So the stream that comes out still has certain hydrogen and carbon monoxide. In fact, a lot of it, the conversion is very low as you can see here by the numbers. And then it is sent through a condenser where you condense out the methanol and then recycle, send it back, uh, the unreacted material mostly. The separation is not complete in the condenser, so there will be a little bit of methanol that also goes back. <coughs> in this particular problem, you are asked to find the molar rate of carbon monoxide, molar rate of uh, hydrogen entering the uh, reactor stream, and then the recycle rate and the product rate. Okay, So there are four unknowns and you are given the remaining as numbers that are measured, for example, from some sort of an experiment. But the reason I wanted to point this out is here we have a stream. Okay, We call this as a stream. That stream is typically characterized by composition of every material in that stream. In this case, these are the two compositions plus the temperature, pressure, and flow rate. 
Okay, so any stream that we are talking about in simulators like Isis or Aspen would be characterized by these uh, numbers, the concentration, temperature, pressure, and flow rate. Now, if in the reactor we assume that the composition is same everywhere from point to point, then we have a lumped model. So in this case, we are going to assume that it's well mixed, so it is a lumped model. And the exit concentration that comes out is the same as the concentration of anywhere in the reactor. And uh, if the operation is taking place under steady state condition, meaning I'm having the feed coming in at a steady rate and the product being produced at a steady rate, there's no change in uh, any of these variables with respect to time, then I have a steady lumped model, which is going to result in a set of algebraic equations. And we need to see whether it is linear or nonlinear. So by the state of a stream, that's what I mean, is characterized by its concentration and its temperature, pressure, and flow rate, typically. And uh, then applying laws of conservation of mass, of energy, of momentum, okay? So that's the important tool that we have in building the model. Applying these because we know mass is conserved, energy is conserved, and momentum is conserved. So we look for things that don't change, that are invariant. And then you say, okay, if I put this in, I know that nothing can get lost how much should come out. It's a very simple balancing the bank book, if you like. Okay, If I put something in and nothing just disappears or appears, then I must have the same thing appearing in a different form, perhaps, on the outlet. So I should be able to relate and be able to predict what the outlet things are going to be. Okay, So it allows us to track changes in the state of the system uh, by applying these laws. Uh, we typically subject the raw materials to either physical treatment, which means there is no change in the chemical composition. Um, so it would be simply separating a species, like in the condenser example. All we are doing is trying to separate methanol. There is no change in the chemical composition. Uh, when we are achieving such a change, we exploit property differences. So it may be density, solubility, volatility, diffusivity, differences in properties of two species. We can use that to achieve the separation. In the condensation, for example, it's a volatility. The two different materials boil at different temperatures. So by adjusting the temperature to be in between the condensation temperature of methanol and that of uh, hydrogen and CO2, we can condense out the methanol. So it's a phase change. But you could also have a chemical treatment, okay, like in the first unit where we have a reaction taking place. So we are actually combining molecules to produce a new molecules, okay. So we are altering the chemical structure in there. So both kinds of equipment are present and the conservation laws still are valid, okay. They can change the form, but still if you put so many amount of carbon, so many moles of carbon must come out, maybe in a different form combined with methanol instead of carbon monoxide. Um, <coughs> so if the state variables are assumed to be independent of time and spatial position, then we have a steady state lumped parameter model. That's what we saw earlier. Independent of time, independent of space means lumped uh, steady state model. And they often result in coupled algebraic equations. Coupled meaning they are interdependent. I may write up, end up writing four equations and four, four variables. But every equation will depend on the other. I cannot solve for one of the variables from the first equation alone because I need to know what others are uh, doing as well. So that's what we say uh, the equations are coupled. If the variables are assumed to have no spatial variation but are time dependent, then we have a dynamic model, a lumped dynamic model, and that results in ordinary differential equation in one independent variable being the time. And those would be called the initial value problem. The reason we call them initial value problem was in, in time, basically you have uh, some instant of time t equal to zero where we know what the initial value is, initial position is. And then we want to predict what the position would be of concentration and temperature as time evolves. <coughs> and uh, if there is no time dependence, but there is a spatial variation, and that too is restricted to one dimension, then we will have again an ordinary differential equation because the dependent variables depend only on one independent spatial position. And those will be called the boundary value problems because space, typically you have an entrance and exit, and those are your boundaries, and you want to see what happens in between those two boundaries. So a typical example, for example, would be a tubular reactor that you have and that has a packed catalyst, and you're putting in feed, and feed is coming out. 
some product is coming out and the concentration is changing with position the position here is x measured from the inlet so those kind of models will depend on an ordinary differential equation of c in one independent variable x but these will be called the boundaries at the inlet x equal to zero and x equal to l for example the length of the reactor so once you build the model then you'll be able to relate the conversion to the length of the reactor for example or to the feed flow rate now if both spatial and time dependence are important then you end up with partial differential equation and as i said uh, we need to classify them further as parabolic elliptic or hyperbolic and we will see that uh, later on in the course now what i want to do is uh, go back to this particular problem and uh, <coughs> uh, build a mathematical model for this particular problem okay that is set up the problem so that i can solve for x y r and p setting up the problem building the model and then solving it using matlab we're going to go through both the process so we have four variables that we are given and we are told find these the rest of those i have given to you Okay, now I could put a variation in a quiz or an exam where I give you X, Y, R, P, but I ask you to find something else. What is the composition of uh, methanol in the recycled stream, for example? I could make that as an unknown. But in this particular problem, there are four variables, so you must assemble four equations, four linearly independent equations. That is, these equations should not depend on each other. You should not be able to derive the third equation by combining the first and the second or simply scaling up the first, etc. And this is a notion of linear independence you must have seen in a linear algebra course. So our task is to develop such equations, four independent, linearly independent equations. How are we going to do that? We are going to take a control volume, which in this case I'm going to call loop 1. Okay. Into that loop, I'm going to identify streams that are coming in. There are two streams that are entering and one stream that is leaving. And I'm going to make a balance of how much of carbon is entering through the two streams and how much is leaving and write an equation for that okay so if you look at for example carbon is entering to um, co in the entrance okay so i have x moles per minute so these are molar flow rates of carbon plus what is coming in through the recycle stream and that is going to be r the recycle rate the total moles per minute multiplied by these are mole fractions you are told that these are mole fractions so there is uh, one carbon atom coming with CO and then one coming with uh, methanol 0 0.004 okay and that should equal what leaves that particular loop uh, through this exit stream so that is going to be the flow rate here is given 275 is the total for flow rate moles per minute multiplied by 0.274 is the mole fraction of carbon monoxide so each carbon monoxide brings uh, so many moles of carbon with it uh, uh, and then uh, methanol 0 0.095 so that is one balanced equation that comes from uh, making a carbon balance and uh, let me write down the resultant if you simplify it it's going to be x plus um, 0.306 r equals on the right hand side will simplify to 101.475 okay that is one equation that we have is that equation linear or non-linear how do you answer that question you look for anything that is not linear okay that so that, that means in all the dependent variables that you are having here there should be no power no quadratic no exponential sign of y or x or r or p in one of them will make it non-linear or even the product x times y or x times r or r times p that will make it non-linear so in this case you don't have that so it is a linear equation so we have one linear equation relating those Two variables in this case so every equation need not have all the four variables in it but each equation have a different set of variables so that still makes it a coupled system meaning you cannot solve for one without knowing what the other one is so you do the same thing for hydrogen but now I'm going to do H2 okay, a molecule of hydrogen okay so here I have Y coming in plus 
in the recycle stream, I have uh, 0.694 moles of hydrogen and then twice 0 0.004 because I have H3 and H. So that there are two hydrogen molecules in each mole of methanol. Okay, so it's going to be 0.694 plus 0 0.008. 0 0.694 plus 0 0.008 is equal to what leaves in this stream for hydrogen which is going to be 275 multiplied by 0 0.631 plus twice for the same reason 0 0.095 okay <coughs> <coughs> that you can simplify to y plus 0 0.702 r equals 225.775 Okay, so we have two equations now. One, two, and our goal is to develop four independent equations. Now let's say in the inner loop, I can also notice I can write an oxygen balance. Okay, so let's do the same thing. So I notice that X moles of O, now just single oxygen, okay, so that's coming. Plus, in the recycle stream, I have 0 0.302 plus 0 0.004 times R moles of O coming. Okay, so point uh, R times point three zero two plus point zero zero four. That is equal to what leaves that loop one inner loop is two seventy five times point two seven four. That is the oxygen in there, and then point zero nine five. So it is two seventy five times point two seven four plus point zero nine five. Okay, and that would simplify to x plus 0.306 r is equal to 101.475. Now, can I label this as my third equation? The answer here is no, and it is obvious, but this need not always be obvious. Okay, so you might find two equations that are kind of dependent on each other, but it's not visible. In this case, it is visible because you can see that equation 1 and 3 are identical. So 3 is not an independent equation. It's the same as one equation. So after all this exercise on three balances, we still have only two linearly independent equation. It is something that you need to watch out for. When you're making mass balances, they're saying if carbon and hydrogen are balanced, automatically oxygen must also be balanced. So it is not an independent uh, condition that we can write down. <coughs> Now, in MATLAB, there are tools that you can use to verify whether a set of equations is linearly independent or not. And I don't know whether you remember it, there's a function called rank, and that will allow us to tell how many independent system of equations are there in a set of model equations that you write down. Um, then, we have, we have exhausted all the possible balances that we could make on the inner loop, and we have only three equations and in that only two are linearly independent. So I need to look for other sources for additional equations because I need four equations to formulate this problem appropriately. So then I see, okay, I can take the outer loop okay, and then I can see what comes in and what goes out and these are the only two streams and I can make an audit of how much of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen are coming in and then <coughs> see whether I can get an additional set of equations from that. Okay, so for the outer loop um, using carbon balance, okay, so I will have x moles of car carbon coming in and that is equal to p because that is the total rate at which methanol leaves. Okay, so the equation is going to be simply x is equal to p. Okay, and that is an independent equation, so I can label that as, uh, let me label that as 4, and then you do the same thing for hydrogen. Okay, so Y, H2 I'm going to take, so Y is equal to 2P, because I have H3 and H, so for every uh, hydrogen that is coming in, whatever the rate should, P should adjust itself so that I have 2P moles of hydrogen that is leaving. Okay. So x is equal to 2p. That is fine. Now you could immediately say I can get rid of p because p doesn't appear anywhere else in the previous three equations. 
This is the process of elimination. Gaussian elimination does exactly that in a very systematic manner. Whereas in problems like this, we can use ad hoc simplification by getting rid of variables and producing a much more condensed system as three variables and three unknowns. Because once you know x, you know p from equation four. Okay, so now we have five equations, but basically this is not a linearly independent equation. So we have four linearly, in hope we have four linearly independent equations that we can solve for. Okay, so we have to answer. We have written down the equations. We have used the principles of conservation of mass, and we have made certain assumptions in building that model. What are those assumptions? Is it steady state or dynamic? It is steady. Because we assume none of the variables depend on time. Is it lumped or distributed? We assume none of the variables depend on space, so it is lumped. Is it linear or nonlinear? Okay, now we need to go back and see are there any variables among the four x, y, r, and p where a nonlinearity appears? Okay, as I said, even if you have x times r or x times y, or that will be considered as nonlinear. But everywhere you notice that x appears only with a number, not with another variable, okay? So this equation one, equation two, y appears by itself, r appears by itself, your x and p appear by themselves, not with another variable, but the constant, it's okay, okay? So this is a linear equation, a system of linear equations. Okay, so the, we can classify this type of equations as uh, uh, set system of linear equations. How do you solve that? Immediately you should know that you can use Gaussian elimination and it is already programmed into MATLAB so you can very easily solve this in MATLAB. But what you should be able to do uh, is to put them in a matrix form. Okay, and uh, I gave you a few minutes in the class to do that. Here I will just uh, enter that in the matrix notation, matrix product notation. Okay, so what we are going to do is we're going to have x, y, r, and p as <coughs> four unknowns. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to put this in the form a x equal to b. So a is a matrix. Two underscores means that it's a matrix. X here is not the same molar concentration, but x is a vector. X is with an underscore is a vector, and that vector consists of these variables x, y, r, and p. And b similarly is a vector which consists of variables on right hand side. Okay, so all you need to do is when you apply the rules of multiplication of matrices, you should get the five equations that we want. I'm going to keep all the five equations because I want to show you how we will check whether they are linearly independent or not. So if you go to the first equation, x gets multiplied by 1, r gets multiplied by 0 0.306, none of them others are, appear there. And the right hand side is 101.475. So all you need to do is put in those 101.475. Okay, and as I said, x is, gets multiplied by 1, it does not have y, so it is 0, and r gets multiplied by 0 0.306, and p does not appear there. So if you carry out using the rules of matrix multiplication, first row with the column and equate it to the right hand side, you will get you back your first equation. That's exactly what we are trying to do when you're putting it in matrix form. When I carry out the multiplication, I should get each one of those individual equations that I have. So in the second equation, there is y and r, but x does not appear, so it's uh, zero. But y appears with a factor of one in front, and um, r appears with 0.702. And P does not appear. In the third equation, we have the same thing as the first one, 0 0.3060. 0. And yeah, I should put the right hand side on the second equation. This is 225.775. In the third equation, it is 101.475. So the first and the third are exactly the same rows. And that is why we would call this as rank deficient or not a linearly independent set of equations. Now the fifth equation, the fourth equation simply has x equal to p, or you can write that as x minus p equal to zero. Okay, x equal to p, or you can write this as x minus p equal to zero. 
That makes the coefficient of x as 1, and y does not appear, and coefficient of p as minus 1 is equal to 0 on the right-hand side. And same thing for the fifth equation, x minus 2p. So it is 1, 0, 0, minus 2, and 0. So we have five equations, and as I said, we notice the redundancy. And simplify by eliminating p. As I said, we could get rid of p, and I asked you to do this on your own, and what you will get if you get rid of p is, you will have just uh, looking at these two equations, combining 4 and 5, you will get x is equal to uh, <coughs> 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 sorry, this should have been a y. I guess you guys didn't uh, well, I'm doing it in my office, so <coughs> you didn't have a chance to correct. This should be y. Okay, so x is equal to uh, p, but uh, <coughs> <laughs> p is equal to y over 2 so you can write that as equal to y over 2 or 2x is equal to y or 2x minus y is equal to 0 so we can now treat this as simply three equations and three unknowns what are the three equations the three equations are the number one and number two with both have x, y, and r, and then the this equation as a third equation. Okay. Then uh, once we find x, you know what p is, and you know what um, um, that's it. You need you need to know what p is. So by eliminating that and rearranging these equations, uh, you will have a new system which will not have p at all in it. This is going to be a well force problem with only three by three. This one is five rows and four columns. Okay, which gets multiplied by <coughs> four rows and one column. So you get five by one, which, which means you get the five equations from there. And on the right hand side, you have five by one. These are rules of multiplication that you should know. Okay, so when you simplify this on the right hand side, you are going to get 101.475. And 225, these are the first two equations, they remain as it is 0.775, and the third equation is 0. Okay, and the first coefficient is 1, 0, 0 0.306, and the next one is 0, 1, and 0 0.702, and the third one is uh, that equation was what? 2x minus y. So it's going to be 2 and uh, 0 minus 1. We can of course flip this on the symbol as well. You can have minus 2 and 1. Uh, on the, You can change the sign of uh, every term in any, any one of those equations without changing this. So at this stage we are now ready to go into MATLAB and see, uh, explore uh, ways of solving it. So let me fire up MATLAB. I'm just waiting for MATLAB to fire up there. Okay. I think my computer needs to be a bit faster. I need probably more memory in the faster processor. It takes quite a bit of time. There it is. <clears throat> MATLAB is a huge program and nobody can master it uh, after all these years. I still don't know all the features, but what is important is for you to learn on your own, the ability to learn uh, certain features in MATLAB as and when you need, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So how to use the help uh, system and uh, how to uh, learn new features in MATLAB as you need. So when you start MATLAB, this is what you get. This is called a command window, which is your workspace. And in this workspace, you can define any variable that you want. You can carry out any operations. 
And the real power of MATLAB comes from its ability to write your own functions as well as use a huge number of functions that are pre-built for you. Okay, so in this particular case, all I want to do is enter that matrix that I have uh, developed. Okay, and how do I enter the matrix? For example, I'm going to call it as A equals, so it's an assignment statement, open square brackets, and then enter the numbers. 1 space 0 space 0 0.306 space 0. That means all these numbers are in one row. And then to indicate that I've reached the end of the row, I put a semicolon. And then I can start entering the numbers in the next row, 0, 1, 0 0.702, and 0, semicolon. Okay. And then I can continue to enter the third row, which would be 1, 0, 0 0.306, 0, semicolon. And then I enter the fourth row, which is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And the fifth row, which is 0, 1, 0, minus 2. And close that parenthesis, matching parenthesis, and then hit enter. So it, pro so what you're doing is you're dynamically defining the dimensions of the matrix. And like in other languages where you have to declare explicitly what the dimension of the matrix is, it makes it really very convenient uh, for you to <coughs> use matrix operations. Now, if I want to check whether these system of equations, the, the matrix has a linearly independent set of rows or columns, <coughs> I use the function called rank. It's a built-in function, and I pass to it the variable that I have defined. So I'm asking, what is the rank of A? Let me know. It does the calculation and says it's 4. Okay, that basically says... <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. There are four linearly independent set of uh, rows there in that. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but this is one of the tools and this is one of the ways that we could use to solve problems. I think this is where we stopped and we'll pick up in the next class.